You know, there's one myth out there that pastors and theologians keep perpetuating, and it's this. It's the myth that art either causes idolatry or art tempts people toward idolatry. So let's think about this. It's as if they think a work of art has some magical or mystical power inside the very work of art that tugs on our hearts and the souls of every patron at every museum, every attendee, every man, woman, or child that happens to come upon a work of art. And that mystical, magical power which comes from within the artwork causes us to lose our very sense of who God is as we fall on our knees to bow and worship this work of art. It's almost like the story of Odysseus and the sirens singing on the shores. They possess such a power that Odysseus cannot resist. A power that overwhelms his senses and overpowers the human will, placing it like in a sort of trance. Now, if that were true, let's just say it's true. If it was true, then the primary problem at museums at all times would be getting people to stop worshiping the art. <laughs> clogging up the hallways so no one can get by. Like if you've seen the Mona Lisa, it's not a huge hallway the last time I was at the Louvre. If you have people worshiping that work of art, you could never get around. And they would require countless security guards to wake people from their stupor, shake them up, maybe slap them around, hey, come out of it. They would need to hand out blindfolds just to keep people from seeing any art on the walls as they try to get them out the door before they worship another work of art. And they would need cleaning crews every night to clear out all the flower arrangements, throw the feet of the work of art, money and change placed before the art as an offering. But there's a real problem with this view. First, it ignores our real world experience. Now I'll speak from my own experience. I've been at some of the greatest art museums in the world. From the National Gallery in London, the Prado in Madrid, the Louvre in France, the Smithsonian Museum in DC, the Uffizi Galleries in Florence, Tate Museum, British Museum in London, the Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, and back to the multitude of museums right here in Los Angeles I've been to. Getty, LACMA, you name it. Now, here's what's curious. With all those museums I've been to, I have never seen someone bow down and worship a work of art. Now, I've seen people stand in awe at the craftsmanship, the technique, and even to ponder the content. I've enjoyed sitting myself down and viewing great works of art. And if any art would cause us to worship it, you'd think it would be these works of art that are worth millions and millions of dollars. With the perfect lighting and rooms where they're placed just right for optimal viewing, if they're going to cause us to worship, this would be the place. But no, it doesn't happen. Why? Because the truth is this, art doesn't cause anything. <laughs> Art doesn't cause idolatry. It doesn't force you to sin. But beyond the problem that this view doesn't fit a real world experience with art, there's another one. Second, this view, held by some pastors and theologians today, actually give the work of art way too much power. In fact, these theologians and pastors who think this way actually elevate art to a level most artists would never even consider. They may wish for it. And trust me, my wife and I work with artists in Los Angeles all the time. We used to teach Bible study across the street from Carnegie Hall in New York City. We've been around these industries, uh, visual art, media, journalism, video games, virtual reality, you name it. We're engaged with artists in all these areas. They don't think this way. They know it is patently absurd. You know, some artists may wish they had that much power, but alas, they don't. I saw this sentiment again last week in a commentary on the book of Exodus, written in 2005 by a well-known, well-respected theologian. And this theologian stated, the problem is that artistry easily becomes idolatry. Baloney. It's not true. It's not biblical. It's not good theology. It's awful theology. And it's in quite a few books by professors and pastors who write on art. So what I want to talk about today is, what is idolatry and why is it that it's simply ludicrous to state art causes idolatry? Welcome, I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts Entertainment Ministries, where we mentor artists and creative professionals to succeed creatively and at the same time grow spiritually. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And if God has called you into a creative career, you need to know you're not alone. 
We have videos, blogs, online courses. We have people as part of our ministry from around the world, from Taiwan and Australia to Norway, South Africa, all over America and Europe. And you can find our courses and everything by using the links down below. And you may say, well, why do we do this? We do this to encourage and equip you so you have confidence working as a Christian in the art world, in media, in the entertainment industry, in the video game industry, whatever you're in. Whether you live in a small market in a tiny village, or you work remotely, or if you live and work in a major market like here in LA, New York, London, Paris, Mumbai, whatever it is. Now, before we jump in, I want to thank you for taking time to watch this video and ask one favor, you know what to do. Take a second, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. It helps people find this content. It really makes a difference. So with that in mind, let's get to it. For the past 500 years, the church has been very wary of visual art and we've elevated it to a platform that is ridiculous. We've actually given it more power by being afraid of it rather than recognizing what the role of visual art is and what it isn't and bringing it back down to a rational, normal level of understanding of what art is. So what is idolatry really? Idolatry is about the heart, the will, and the desire to worship something that's not God. That is basically the biblical view. The second commandment states this, don't make things and then worship them. Here it is from Exodus 20. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and serve them. You see, it's not a problem to make things. God had the Israelites make all kinds of things to put in the tabernacle. Solomon put all kinds of things in the temple, including things above, angels' wings, over the, over the Ark of the Covenant, all kinds of vegetation, all kinds of things. None of that was a problem. And I get into this more in our video on the second commandment. I'll leave a link for that below. If you really want to get into the exegesis and understand in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, in the Ten Commandments, why it doesn't mean art causes idolatry. It never meant that. Really understand that. The best place is our arts and entertainment Institute and our core principles from Bezalel. And I'll send a link, I'll put a link for that down below as well. That's our kind of graduate level course. If you want a whole course in theology of art, that's the place to go. It's better than anything you can get at any seminary, any graduate school. Trust me, we have professors at Christian colleges who take this content and are blown away. Now, so if that's what you're looking for, I'll put a link down below. Back to the issue. The problem came when the Israelites worshipped something other than God. Consider Deuteronomy 4, starting verse 15. Therefore watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. Therefore beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, because that wouldn't match what God did. Any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, and it goes on. The likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. Being exhausted, like you, none of those substitute for God. And remember, this is what the Egyptians did. This was the model for worshiping God in Egypt. So God is saying, don't do what the Egyptians did. But go to verse 19. It's not just animals. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, all the stars, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. All from Deuteronomy 4 verses 15 to 19. So God's saying clearly, don't do what they did in Egypt. Don't worship the things I made, like stars, the sun, the moon, and don't worship stuff that humans make, like sculptures, trinkets, or statues of angels, saints, etc. The problem is not in the object of worship. God made the stars, the moon, and the sun, and he said specifically in creation, it was good. Those things are good. They don't cause idolatry. The object of worship isn't the problem. The problem is in our hearts. Think about it this way. Great food is not the cause of gluttony. Beautiful people are not the cause of lust. A lazy boy chair is not the cause of sloth. And art is not the cause of idolatry. 
Calvin famously said, our hearts are idol factories, which in this day and age, most pastors and theologians agree. That's really the point. Our hearts are idol factories. You see, as humans, we are worshipers, meaning we want to worship and give glory to something. If we don't worship the one true God, we'll end up worshiping something else. And that something else is what God calls an idol. So it can be a literal carved statue of some Egyptian god like Isis or Horus. It can be some modern day god like you see in the Far East in a street corner shrine. But it can be literally anything in which you put your hope and in which you trust. You see, when people hear the word idols today, the picture is something like these shrines. But idol worship is not limited to shrines. Consider Ezekiel 14 verse 3. God says to the elders of Israel, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. That's where the problem is. Here God was saying that our hearts can turn anything into an idol. Money, success, power, being married to the right family, having the right college degree. You see, idolatry happens when we treat these things not just as good things, but as ultimate things. When we see them as giving our life purpose and meaning, when we just have to have them or can't do without them, they become idols. And notice, there's nothing wrong with a good family, or a good college degree, or having money. The problem is not what you are pursuing, the problem is how your heart is pursuing and perceiving those things. You know, if Jesus were here today, and one of us decided to take him to the great museums of the world, he wouldn't object to the creativity of art. After all, it's part of the image of God in us. God is a creator. We've been given a similar passion and desire. You wouldn't object to the fact that we've created art that depicts humanity and wildlife and trees and food and the entire galaxy. I think you find joy in how we've developed our skills and talents. But suppose that now he walks down the street into an elementary school and sees books he used to teach children about the gospel. There are even pictures of Jesus himself as a baby in the manger. Jesus as a public speaker and Jesus calming the waves in the sea. That Jesus would enjoy seeing all the ways we have tried to keep the stories alive and vibrant for our children. He'd see that it is our present day method of obeying the Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. And these words that I command you till day shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. See, we who've been saved love Jesus, our Savior. We want to honor him. And more than almost anything, we want to pass down to our children a deep understanding, a deep appreciation, a deep love for Jesus and the gospel. If we can make up a song, children will sing and think about the gospel. We'll do it. Maybe Jesus loves me, or Jesus loves the little children, or Father Abraham. They may sound silly and fun, but we're getting those ideas into our children's hearts, minds, and souls. If we can get children's books to teach our kids about Jesus, instead of simply more information about a new Marvel comic, or a Pokemon character, or a Disney story void of the gospel, we should do it. We want something just as exciting and inspiring, but something that points our kids to Christ. God's given us the desire and ability to write music, to create movies and musicals, given us the ability to paint and sculpt and dance, all in order to express our ideas and aspirations. I imagine Jesus would love to see our kids performing a little nativity play. I imagine Jesus would love to hear kids singing new songs about the gospel. You might even think of how David used to say, I need to sing a new song to the Lord, and yet we're still doing it thousands of years later. I imagine Jesus would love to see all the ways we express our faith and long to share both the truth of the gospel and the impact of the gospel upon our own lives. And in all this, would we offend Jesus that we drew a baby in a manger to demonstrate the humanity of Jesus? No. Would we offend Jesus that we painted a man calming the seas so we could teach our children who the Prince of Peace really is? No. Would we offend Jesus because we sculpted a man on the cross to show our children the price Jesus paid for our sins? No. I can imagine Jesus commenting how Peter never looked the way the artist painted him, and Thomas wasn't nearly so dopey, even though he doubted. He wasn't that dopey as people paint him. But the fact we tried to keep telling the story to the next generation, and the next generation was a good thing. None of this is the problem because art is never the problem. 
The real problem has to do with the intent of the art and the way it was used by the audience. If a Rembrandt painting of Jesus calming the seas in the Lake of Galilee was suddenly found to be in a secret wing of the National Gallery in London, and people were burning incense to the painting and praying to the painting, we have a very serious problem and a violation of the Second Commandment. Clearly. Now there's an interesting story that happened in the Old Testament, talking about the bronze serpent. Remember when they were in, the Israelites were in the desert, God called Moses to make a bronze serpent for people to look at, and they would be healed. They wouldn't die from the bites from the serpents. And later on the time of Hezekiah, people started burning incense to that bronze serpent and worshiping it. So something God commissioned that was good, that's a picture of Christ we find in the New Testament, was abused and it became idolatrous, not by the intent, not by the artist, not by the commissioner. Moses didn't sin, God didn't sin, he doesn't sin. All of that was right. It's all in our heart what we do with these objects. And it's the same with a painting. It's not any different. So how does idolatry work? Well, the human heart is prone to worship. And it only has two options, really. Worship God, your creator, or worship something else, which is an idol. Anything we worship that is not God is an idol to us. And we will worship anything other than God. We have broken the second commandment, forbidding us from worshiping God. Idols. Now, there are two steps to committing idolatry. Think of it this way. First, you experience something you find attractive, empowering. It's going to get you ahead in life. It's going to give you meaning. It's going to give you satisfaction. And then secondly, you give that one thing the ultimate place in your heart and mind. It can be anything. People do this with money. If I have enough money, that's my salvation. If I have enough power, I will never be taken control of, never be a victim again. That becomes your salvation, your savior. It can be sex. If I have the most amazing, wonderful, intimate life, that will rescue me, right? But the heart of the matter is your heart. Art does not force you to worship it as an idol, nor does money or power or sex. It's all about what you allow your heart to prize, to pursue, and to make a priority in your life. Idolatry was never really about the object of your worship, so much as it was about the reality that you are worshiping that object. God's not threatened by the stars and the moon and the sun and all these things that he made that people worship and make idols of. And he's not threatened by trinkets, or little stone statues that can't speak, that can't do anything. They are mocked over and over in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're nothing. The issue is that you're worshiping the object. Not that the object exists. And the object has no power on its own. So, because idolatry is a matter of the heart, it's not a matter of art. We must get this correct. If church leaders are going to actually inspire and support Christians in the art world, the media, or the entertainment industry. And I know some pastors will support it for a season because it's hip or think that it'll save people, which is a form of utilitarian view of art. I'm not talking about that, what, being an opportunist, or using it for evangelism, which reduces art to propaganda and utilitarianism. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pastors and leaders in the church who believe art is meaningful and useful, and it doesn't always have this little warning, it's going to cause idolatry, watch out. Well, do they say that to financial planners? Do they say that to, uh, to lawyers? Do they say it to everybody else? Well, watch out, you can make an idol out of this, because they do. They warn every politician in your church, you could turn an idol out of the power that you're accruing through politics. They should. But we don't. We single out artists. We've got to stop doing it. So, let me know in the comments, was this helpful to you? Do you have a pastor or a parent who needs to hear this? Who may be encouraged by it or challenged by it? Please share it with them. And honestly, if your pastor wants to debate me on this topic, I'll do it live, I'll do it streaming, or I'll do it private in person. Doesn't matter. I would love the opportunity to do so and to help edify the body and Christ by getting to the core truth of what Scripture says and how we're to encourage artists. And do me a favor, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Check the links out down below for a video on the Second Commandment, learn about our online courses, or even our institute if you want to really get deep in the theology and understand the Old Testament, what God's really saying about 
idolatry, about artists and how art has always been used to influence culture through people like Bezalel. Check out that institute. And don't forget, I would love to hear your comments. How have you encountered people thinking what you do as an artist is dangerous because it leads to idolatry? Where have you heard that? How have you debated that? Has it been helpful, not helpful? What resources have been helpful for you? And let me know if there's anything I can do to further clarify these issues so that you can experience the freedom Christ died to give you, which is what Paul says in Galatians. So experience that freedom in Christ. Leave your comments down below. And I look forward to continuing the conversation.